During the um, hurricanes and others, what he has had to work through and work with FEMA, I thought it was important for him to be here to, to give an evaluation of where we are and what we'll need into the future. I also asked Congressman Re Russ Fulcher to come as well. He's from Idaho and um, going through a number of fires there that I worked with him on FEMA and others. And so what we wanted to do is to be on the ground. Um, we got an aerial view of the devastation and my first comments to all of those um, in Maui, um, our, our prayers are with you. Uh, the devastation, the, the loss of life, the loss of homes. Um, you see them on, you see the pictures and I've been through a number of fires that can have some similarities as Paradise and others in California with a number of casualties, but the intensity of this fire, the fast moving with the um, winds and others, is just sheer devastation, sheer devastation. Uh, met with the governor, met with the mayor, um, we met with FEMA, all the resources, we went to the resources center, we met with those who, who have lost their homes and uh, spoke, spent time with them and what's going through, walking through the school being destroyed and realizing just the sacred area that this is. I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be able to come here with my family many times before and knowing that area, spending time there in the restaurants, down by the tree, um, and knowing how much that meant um, to everyone and seeing how can we make sure we find all those who are still lost and how do we rebuild. That's the important part of why we're here. We want to make sure we do it in the right manner. We want to work with the community. Uh, we want to be respectful for the history behind this area. We want to be respectful for the lives that were lost there. Um, we want to get the resources to individuals so they could rebuild their life. We've got to focus on the children for the schools, get them back into the education so they don't miss out. We know. Um, it's not just physical pain, it's the mental pain going through what they're going through, the tragic situation. And uh, walking through some of the um, resource centers, setting up, be it, everybody has some different needs right now because they lost everything and had to move so quickly. And I, I will tell you the one part, uh, we sat with the Coast Guard, talking to this young Coast Guard officer who um, was a Division II swimmer jumping in the water on a paddleboard going out to bring 17 different lives out of the water to save them that night. Um, it, 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 uh, very proud. Uh, I think there are a lot of heroes out there and individuals who brought their own boats, people that helped pull other people out to get them out of harm's way. Uh, we want to make sure that we honor those individuals too. You know, in every devastation in America, um, they're tragic, but at the same time, it does show when you le look deep down the caringness of individuals. When I walked through the Resources Center, I saw people in the Red Cross from all states volunteering their time to come out from long hours that uh, you do find in these most difficult situations the caringness of love of one another. And uh, I hope Maui begins to feel that from all of us, uh, that we are going to be here for you. Um, we know this won't be something that gets solved just overnight. We want to do it right. We want to make sure that um, we find out what went wrong, that it never happens again. What type of mitigation when it comes to the fuel and others? Uh, what prepares us so this devastation can never come back for another time? and that we don't have to lose these lives and making sure the resources uh, are there but have a good accountability of what we, how we provide it. Um, with that, let me turn it over to your Congresswoman who uh, I know has been, I think, here almost every single day. Uh, I know she's talked to a lot of members. We had a long discussion ahead of time and um, I know when we go back into session, she'll be talking to more members as well. That's why I wanted to make sure this bipartisan delegation was here as well, that we can go out and talk about the experience of what we heard. And there's a lot of individuals here that have expertise around that, those committees as well. But to Congressman Takuda, um, thank you for your work so far as well. Appreciate you. Thank you, Speaker McCarthy, um, and to, to my colleagues that have joined us today. You know, I've said it from the very first day, this is a national 
tragedy, a national disaster that demands a national response, what you see here beside me is that national response that we so desperately need. As I've walked through the resource centers, as I've walked through the shelters at one point, and now the hotels, as I've seen different people in action at every point of this operation, I have seen our country, individuals, heroes, as speaker said, from all parts of the country, even the world, step forward and step up to support our Maui Ohana. Speaker, you and I had a conversation about how you can see the videos, you can see the pictures, but until you get your feet there, you really can't understand the intensity with which we are living every single day, the urgency that we feel that we really need to make sure that our people, our families, get the resources and support that they need, that the action, the urgency cannot absolutely stop. And I will tell you this, I truly appreciate on behalf of all of my constituency, the fact that now we can truly call you part of our ohana, our family, because we know that after what you have seen, what you have smelt, what you have felt, what you have heard today from our, our community, being right there in Lahaina amongst our people, amongst the very res first responders that have been heroes from day one, we know you are part of our ohana that is gonna fight like hell every single day to make sure that Maui knows we will not leave you behind, that we are here for the long haul, and that we know it's not gonna take days or weeks or months. This is not just years. I have talked about this in terms of generational support. But I hope what you also saw today is the fire and the spirit, the spirit of our people. We are fighters here. They have hope. What we need right now is help. Constant help from across this country, a national response to make sure that as we look ahead and look forward, we can hold our head high and we know that it's not just about recovery. It's rebuilding a Lahaina, a Maui, a Hawaii that we love. So I am truly grateful for my colleagues for joining me today. It doesn't matter what you know party you come from, this truly is a national response that is being given to a state and a community that has suffered much. And we are very blessed to have you here. So on behalf of our constituents, welcome to our ohana. And I know that when I go back and fight to make sure that resources are provided for our community, I will have my family next to me. And you can be assured that we're gonna fight to make sure that the family only grows because we definitely need support and help going forward. At this time, I would like to introduce Representative David Joyce, um, head of the Appropriations Subcommittee for Homeland, very important for our community. Representative. Thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, I certainly appreciate not only uh, the hospitality of the folks here, and, and certainly Jill, but I'd also be remiss if I didn't bring up my committee member, Ed Case, who has sought out from day one to make sure that we had the opportunity to come here and see firsthand the devastation. You wouldn't be human if you didn't feel it as you walked around on the streets today and have a different appreciation after learning the, the, the holy ground uh, and, and, and how passionate someone like Jill is and Ed on behalf of the uh, people of Maui to bring this back. And I can pledge you one thing, that when we go back, uh, the speaker has told us to make sure that we can find the resources to bring Maui back. It may not come back perfectly, it may not come back the way it was the day before the fire, but it can come back. And we're gonna make sure that we target the resources to meet the needs of the people of this island. And I really uh, want to again express my most deepest, deepest uh, heartfelt sympathy towards those who have passed, but to those who have stayed, who are here to rebuild, we're here with you. And to those pe members of all the different organizations from all over the world who came here and are doing the jobs that are necessary to help rebuild us, God bless you all. God bless the heroes who were there that night because it proves one thing. As I tell folks, we may run with a red jersey on or a blue jersey on, but when we're in Congress, we put on red, white, and blue jerseys and do what's right for our country. And these are the times when we all have to gather together and do what's right for our country. And with that, I'd like to introduce a man who has taught me just today, on it, let alone uh, what I need to know even more about in the future with his expertise, uh, Representative Moskowitz from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the speaker uh, for allowing me to join him on his trip today. I want to thank uh, my freshman colleague, uh, Representative Takuda, who uh, is going to be a real fighter 
uh, for Maui and Congress to make sure that they have the resources that they need. Listen, as the former director of emergency management in the state of Florida, I've seen a lot of devastation, but I got to be honest, today was overwhelming uh, to see how this all happened and how fast it happened. Uh, and so for the families who lost loved ones, it is going to be a very hard journey. You don't move on, you move forward, uh, and our hearts are with you. And for those who lost everything, you know, rebuilding is going to take uh, some time. But uh, you have the full faith of the federal government here. FEMA is leading that effort. Uh, Bob Fenton, the regional administrator for this area, has brought all of those resources in to make sure that the response uh, is going well and that laying the groundwork for all of that uh, recovery efforts and then eventually the rebuilding efforts. And I want to thank the Coast Guard uh, for their efforts, real heroes uh, saving people and all the emergency management personnel, both in the Maui Emergency Management Center and uh, also uh, in uh, at the state. Uh, and with that, I want to introduce uh, Representative Fulcher from Idaho. Good afternoon to all of you. And as the speaker mentioned, I am from the, the great state of Idaho. The people of Idaho say hello, and uh, uh, their prayers and thoughts are with, with all of you as well. Wildfire is not a strange thing to my state. We typically will have a, a fire year of somewhere around a half a million acres. It, it's not uncommon to lose that much in, uh, in, in a wildfire, but most of the time, not always, but most of the time, it's in, it's in remote areas, it's in with large timber uh, stand areas, as opposed to in a dense urban area. And so walking through, uh, going over today, uh, the area of Lahaina, it, it's just first impressions. I have not seen melted glass before from a windshield. There were streams of, of molten metal on the ground, and I didn't know what that was until someone made the connection that that's actually the, the aluminum block of a motor. And the heat was so hot that it actually melted an aluminum block of a motor. And so when we talk about our human uh, brothers and sisters and maybe uh, some of those that aren't accounted for yet, it kind of connected that realization that maybe there's nothing left to identify. And so, of course, that triggers what we're attempting to do and facilitate needs for our brothers and sisters in Maui. And, uh, and so you see a tremendous effort going on there. I thank my colleagues for their support and I'm learning from them as well. But also the other part of our mission is to try to understand exactly what happened and try to communicate methods, try to uh, uh, underscore and, and learn from that so that we can do our best to make sure something like this never happens again. And so to all of you, and, and certainly from the great state of Idaho, uh, we appreciate you. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. Mr. Speaker, thank you for facilitating this. I turn this back over to you. I will tell you, as, as we walked um, walked the areas, temperatures have to be above 1,600 degrees before glass will melt. It's probably around 2,000 degrees. At times, it didn't make sense where a house would burn, the cars would burn, and then one little part may be saved. A fire truck destroyed, caught up in flames. But we heard other stories or a fireman commandeering a police car pushing in to save the firemen in there who are fighting. Or a policeman holding the line even though his house was inside burning. Or the firemen fighting the fire while their house is burned. I watched time and again that people would risk their own lives. I know for those who are just devastated and they're wondering which way they go. Um, I watched the resource center set up to provide all the different elements to help. We know this won't be fast, but there's two main goals. We want to make sure that we all work together. I just walked out of a facility here getting reports from all areas. And you know what, with a little pride, one of the firemen sitting back there is a fireman from my hometown, from Kern County, came over here. We've watched place people from every state to show they want to give back and help as well. We'll get the assessments. I've talked to your senator. I've talked to your other congressman. I've talked to your governor. Find ways that we can work together.
to get the synergy to make sure we can rebuild, but rebuild in a smart way. Um, and also showing the respect to the heritage of the area of what we're building in. And also the respect of the lives that were lost there, knowing where they're, knowing where they're laying. We want to do it in a way that protects people at the same time. So it might not be as fast as everybody likes, but we want to make sure it's protected. I know that I know the millions of individuals who had visited that area, maybe on a vacation or coming through, what it meant to them generation after generation. And we know at the end of the day, they're going to come back. And they're going to be able to celebrate an area that's even better, that kept the tradition of the past, but applied it to a changing future. So this incident won't happen again. So we will investigate to find out why did it happen, what went right, what went wrong, so other communities won't ever have to see this. Um, with that, let me open it up for questions. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Sumiko with NBC Network News. The scope of this tragedy is nearly incomprehensible. Would you or someone please address the fact that the numbers of unaccounted for seem to be all over the map? What, why is that? Do we soon see um, a more narrowing? Yeah, I, I'm not an expert, but from the questions I asked today, I had that same question. It's one of the reasons, some of the first things uh, Jill and I were talking about and concern for children and others. The calls that were coming in, remember the time and the place of where it's at. Sometimes people just have a first name. And I know the FBI has been whittling that down. Um, the intensity of the fire itself as well. You know that we brought the number of cadaver dogs in to be able to walk through and they've been through almost every single area even on a second time I could tell from our tour. Uh, the latest indication I have is it has really narrowed down. Um, I'm not an expert, I haven't been here long enough. Could that number go a little higher? Uh, I think it, it very well could but I believe the number of those who are missing now on the list has really whittled down. I think each day it'll get closer. If I can just quickly yes. answer that, that question. And it is a very difficult number and quite frankly any one person um, that is unaccounted for or marked as a casualty is one too many as far as we're concerned. The difficulty is that this was an aggregate of so many different lists, in some way publicly crowdsourced. You had the Red Cross list, you had the counties list. It was all put together. We know there was multiple duplications at many times. Rob, Robert, James, Jim, all of these names had to be verified against each other. That's why you saw lists that went from above 1,200 shrunken down to a few hundred, and now the governor has said he expects it to go down even more. This is about multiple levels of verification. This is where actually the federal support from the FBI, from Maui County Police, we even have Honolulu Police Department, we have so many different entities coming together to really identify who in fact is missing uh, and try to match that up, unfortunately, with the 115 uh, rem sets of remains that we have and that also I would tell you speaker has been an amazing process a real collaboration between federal state county and even private partners to make sure that no one goes unknown that families get some closure so there is angst that that list even exists um, but we are doing our best right now I know multiple agencies to bring that down to a point um, and really bring everyone home I know we, we have brought in the most sophisticated uh, up-to-date knowledge you can on identification um, utilizing it here and um, we will make sure that we find everything that we can but we, we want to be thoughtful about it I know in the resource center there are still pictures up of people who are missing so anybody that can help and identify yes ma'am uh, yeah, Kirsten Down with Honolulu Civil Beat um, there's another really big crisis and that's FEMA's running out of money um, what are you guys doing to try to advance to get money back to the I, I, don't, I think if you talk to if you talk to FEMA, they have no concerns about where, where they're going to be. It's, um, the acronym is DERF. Uh, we are out of session right now when we go back in on the 12th. Um, government funding is this time period. Government funding goes till September 30th. It will be replenished. And uh, what you'll look at, too, is it's not just Hawaii. We had floods in Vermont. We just had a hurricane in Florida. We had a hurricane in California. Um, we've got fires in Florida. Uh, we'll be able to work through, look at the accounting of what people need, and uh, make sure the assessments are there, and make sure the money is spent wisely. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question for Congresswoman Takuda, if I may. 
Um, I met with the principal of Sacred Heart Schools, and she said she was happy to report that all 220 of her students were accounted for. Mm -hmm. The public school system is a different thing. We have a state public uh, school system. And to date, I just got this from the Department of Education. The remainder of students who have not re-enrolled in another public school or opted for distance learning who may have moved out of state enrolled in private schools, they don't know. That is 1,757 students. It seems that our public school system on week four has not taken any kind of roll call or have any idea if any of their public school students are unaccounted for. Should they know that? You know, I know it's been extremely difficult to be able to even communicate with a number of our students and our families. We absolutely need to make sure that we are connecting up with all of our students and our families. We need to make sure that we have ideally physical connection with our children as soon as possible with their families because we know that every day that goes by, that social emotional connection, um, you know, that support that they need right now is so critical in addition to academic, but especially now my concern is that social emotional uh, support that we need to give all of our students and quite frankly their families and their parents as well. I do know that the department is asking students to re-enroll. One of the issues was that school had not even begun at this particular point. So student had, students hadn't come back in so that we knew fully how many students were enrolled in our school since every year we ask you to re-enroll at the end, but there is fall off in attrition. Uh, at the beginning of school year. So unfortunately, we missed that opportunity to really be able to say exactly how many students were enrolled in these schools. But bottom line is we need to accelerate our connection um, with our students and their families because our kids need help right now. Um, everyone is suffering from our first responders to those working the front lines, especially our victims and our families. But our keiki, we need to make sure that we have not just eyes, but we really have our arms around them right now. And so we need to work very quickly and urgently with our department to make sure they have both the resources, the manpowers, and the capacity to be able to connect with our kids. And then as we've talked about today, there will even need to be temporary facilities because we completely lost one of the schools. Our colleagues got to actually walk there and see a school that once housed 600 elementary school students that will not be there for them. Um, and making sure that they have a safe, conducive place to, to learn uh, and again, as you've heard from the superintendent, there might be multiple means in which um, we offer education based upon families' preference and students' preferences as well. But bottom line is we need to connect as quickly and urgently as possible with our children and provide them with that social emotional support that they absolutely need right now. I would tell you, the sooner the kids are in school, the better. You think about what just happened during COVID and now being out and uh, just the point the congresswoman would make, the emotion that they, need, they should be back together as soon as possible. It's some of the issues that we raised with the governor, the governor talked about even from a temporary part. Uh, yes? Mr. Speaker, my name's Eddie with Hawaii News Now. I know you're working to get like familiarized with the islands. I've only been here four years, but there's some things I've learned in those couple years being here. Um, just the two things I wanted to point out, more than half of Native Hawaiians now live outside of Hawaii, um, mainly because of the high cost of living. Um, two, if you go to the grocery store, just as a single person to buy one meal can cost anywhere from 30 to $50 for just one meal. Um, so obviously Hawaii is different from the rest of the states. My question to you is, you know, recently we've seen people like Oprah and The Rock donate millions of dollars to do like $1,200 a month in monthly payments. Federal government did a $700 one-time payment. The speaker holds awesome power when it comes to funding. Is there anything you might be able to do to increase that payment? Well, I think the greatest thing we do is help rebuild what was lost. The next thing we do is create policies that make the costs come down so people won't leave the island. I've been coming to the island for more than 25 years. Um, I, 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 I love the islands. Um, I love this part of the country. Um, I, I think the ways that we can make, create policies that people could take more of their money home, get taxed less, have gas prices lower, be more energy efficient, have groceries bills less, inflation hurt us all in this country. So those are the items I think I could work on, but most importantly right now with the Lahaina fire, how do we from a federal government help do our part and our responsibility to help rebuild? I think we're showing it every day by the number of people who are here, the resources that came overnight, uh, even sit situations where some of them were led up beforehand. I think we can prove that each day. So, yes ma'am. Um, yes, you mentioned um, some of the disasters 
hurricanes in California that haven't been seen before. So when you guys are investigating what happened with this fire, how much are you going to look into climate change and um, you know the big the big picture of all these kind of disasters happening that have never kind of with weather patterns and things that have never really been seen before? Well, hurricanes have hit California before. Hurricanes have hit Florida before. Floods have hit um, Vermont. The hurricane actually didn't hit Hawaii. The high winds did. The one things that you can look at, even if the temperature has changed before on this earth and gone down and gone up, the mitigation, the fuel, the grass. Um, why did some buildings survive and others not? Did they have a different roof? One thing we have found when we've gone through in Florida, when you rebuild, you rebuild to a different code, a stronger code. Um, the protection. Sometimes we have found that if you have hurricane glass, then the wind doesn't get inside to lift off your roof. Sometimes you find that when you clear out the fuel before your house, your house survives. I know that you've got a red tile roof sitting out there amongst surviving all the others. But they did mitigation for all that. You also want to look at resources. You know, there's, this may not particularly happen to this within a perfect storm of a, of a wind blowing this hard, but we could utilize going forward artificial intelligence to pre-position based upon weather resources to battle them ahead of time. So I think we should think smartly. We should look at the fuel system that's sitting out there and mitigate that. So if you do have a wind like this. What was interesting on that day, you had a number of fires on the island. You had a fire that started in Lahaina even earlier in the day that was put out. We do not know the cause of this. There's some people who talk that it was a power line. Well, the power line isn't about a temperature change. And a power line that has trees and brushes around it in a, in a dry year is something different. Should you relook at, maybe there shouldn't be power lines above ground. So there are ways of different parts of the country that have done things differently. So when we look at the rebuilding of Lahaina, let's do it in a manner that protects us for the future at the same time. But should there be mitigation you know, against climate change, things that can be done so that we're not having these you know, unbelievable weather patterns you know, day you know, every place? It's not, this is like last five years, I've seen more disasters than you know, in the past. So I mean, is there mitigation that you can I, I think there's disasters and they're going to continue to be disasters. I think we could better, better prepare where a disaster doesn't happen. Had we um, done something on the power lines, maybe this never would have happened. Had we done something with the mitigation of the fuel, the grass around, and pushed away, had we had a different fire break. The other thing you have to remember too, Lahaina is different than other cities in Maui. It is a much older city, much more built on wood, smaller streets, so a smaller fire break. Um, so there are a number of things that we can look at in a code building when you're going forward. I, I've been to hurricanes in Florida where I can look where a whole area is wiped out and then there's buildings look like brand new, nothing ever happened to them. Why? Because they were built to a higher code. And I think when we rebuild here, that's exactly what we should do. I could just yes. point out something too, to take it in a slightly different direction and I think my colleagues definitely saw this today. Um, we live in a very rural and remote set of islands and so dealing with any kind of disaster is very different. So we need to talk about infrastructure, we need to talk about preparedness of what it's like to live in rural and remote communities where help unfortunately doesn't come immediately. We can't just drive it in from another state or jurisdiction. Um, a lot of the equipment we might need has to literally be put on a barge, it has to fly over here, um, it has to drive miles in. I mean just for us to get from the airport to Lahaina takes a long time as we know and so I do think it was helpful to be on the ground driving physically from one place to another um, even for them to stay in another burn area, quite frankly, and have to drive to and from different areas, seeing the lack of resources and availability in many cases and what we need to make sure we prepare for as an island community, as a rural and remote state, to be able to make sure that on each island 
all of our communities are prepared should disaster strike to be able to immediately start to address these issues, mitigate any kind of damage as resources takes its time, unfortunately, to get to us. And so I think that is a really important takeaway from today is how do we make sure Hawaii is prepared as a rural and remote state? Quite frankly, many other states are in very similar situations. And as Congress, we have to make sure that we act to support each and every one of that, them because disaster does not discriminate. It doesn't care if you're an urban state or a rural state. I think a lot of the questions that we asked today, a lot of things we saw today will help us prepare better as a rural community here in Hawaii. And one point that Joe makes, when there is a fire disaster in California, we pull from a lot of different other counties. I mean, I think one internal question Maui's going to have to look at, do they have a large enough fire department? That, that was a perfect storm with, with the winds and others. But what most people, I think, across the nation don't realize, a lot, a lot of those resources were fighting another fire at the same time. So are the resources put in the right place, and is there enough resources there? Um, people can continue to look, was the water available? If you're, if you're going to fight, I, I watched the, the fire truck there. It wasn't a fire engine. It was a patrol car that would fight watershed fires, which this started out to be. It had a fire earlier in the morning. Another one breaks out somewhere else. But when you look at resources just in fire, my family's a firefighting background, okay? Um, when you have a grass fire, watershed, you come and put it out, but it's still smoldering. You, you really need to keep people there, keep just putting water on it. But you had another blaze, rather large blaze, break out in another part of Maui where you needed the resources to protect the homes. Then you have wind picking, picking up that can take the embers and push it somewhere else. And we watched how far it pushed, pushed it deep into the ocean. We were just meeting with the Coast Guard. I mean, part of this cleanup is a number of vessels of ships that burnt and sank out into the harbor. I mean, the number that people are talking about could be higher than 40. I mean. The devastation here is very large, and so what, that's part of the investigation. How do you build in a manner that this doesn't happen again? And how do you make sure that you have the resources? There's a lots of times when some of these disasters become a 100-year situation. Are you prepared for that situation at the same time? I mean, the first responders were pulled so many areas that day. Um, yes, sir? Uh, Jay April Akaku. Uh, Speaker McCarthy, you said we don't know the cause. And I don't think we know the immediate cause, and we may not for a long time. But almost everyone knows the root cause, which is climate change. Uh, 2023 may be the year of oil company weather. What are we doing to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and the federal support of the fossil fuel industry? I think you, you and I will pr probably end up having a difference of opinion. Uh, I, I would sit and wait and look because uh, I walked the streets and I saw the power lines. Uh, I saw a, a, that a watershed grass fire started earlier in the day. Um, w w one thing I, I, I will tell you is when you look to and um, cause, I've watched America reduce their CO2 emissions. I watched that God blessed America that if we are able to have energy independence where we used all resources, um, not only could we supply America's energy needs, we could take care of our allies and even our adversaries. If we simply replaced Russian natural gas in Europe for one year, you would lower CO2 emissions by 218 million tons. But it's very difficult in a world that China continues to expand. Why? Our natural gas helps the world become cleaner. But um, I think you can go back in the history of the earth and you could find these incidents happening all the times before. You're saying climate change isn't real? I'm saying climate change is there, but if you're going to blame climate change on this, I think you ought to wait until the study comes because a lot of people lost their lives. They probably wouldn't have had to if we had a different mitigation on how we treated uh, a lot of different areas. So, yes. Last question. Is there any kind of, um, Christy Wilson with Honolulu Star Advertiser, is there any kind of a timetable for the congressional investigations? Yeah, look, I, I don't want to put a timetable on because uh, right now we've got to get the facts um, on a lot of different areas. And so we will be gathering that information. I would like to get a lot of that more input in. 
um, it would be a bipartisan way to look at it. I would like to get a lot of experts from Hawaii giving us their feedback, a lot of people from Lahaina as well. Uh, right now, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure these people have homes. We're trying to make sure they have the resources. We want to get the kids back in school. And as we gather the rest, and then we want to be able to rebuild. But Do you we see any keep of that busy. happening in Hawaii, like holding any panel? Yeah. Stuff, you know. Look, uh, one, one thing, um, when I was fortunate enough to become speaker, that I'd like to do is not just open Congress back up to the people, but take Congress out to the people. So we have been holding a number of hearings on issues outside of Washington where things actually happen. It's really hard for all the way across <laughs> the country to, to hold some investigation about something that happened here. I think what you see today is the approach we're taking. This is bipartisan expertise to come in and just get the facts. We watched American lives get lost. We don't want that to happen again. So we just want to find out what happened and how we, I believe in constant improvement from resources of what did the federal government do? What can we improve each and every time we do that from a resource basis into the future? Could we have something pre-placed? Do we need a larger fire department to control this? Do we need different standards and codes of building? These, these are discussions that we had with the governor today as well. Yes, did you have a question, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, after visiting the, the site, uh, what was your personal reaction just, just stepping onto that site? You know, um, I don't think anybody can go there and not be moved. I don't think anybody can go there and, and not have emotions overtake them. It's, it's different that we've watched in, in our lives that somebody had a house fire. This, this is taking out a total community. It's taking out one that has some of the longest history on this island. It's taking one that many of us have been to before and have these fond memories. But when you look there and you see the devastation, it's not like there's buildings totally fall. There's apartment buildings. I did not know it was an apartment until Jill pointed out the only thing that was standing was elevator shafts. There were four stories. And the first thing that I think in my mind is, did everybody get out? You walk down to the school, you walk down to Fleetwoods, you walk down to places that you've seen and known. And then you see the cars. The cars aren't just stopped, they're burned down where the alloy is just melted into the streets. And then these stories that you were told that you watched people that, that were stuck, I, I don't quite, you know, I, I can't know the experience of it, it's just, it's emotional when they tell you it, right? That you're watching people, their only way out was to jump into the ocean. But then they had to sit there. But it's not like you just walk into the water. You had to get further out. That the, that the, that the, the fire burned out where it burnt the, the vessels, the boats. I cannot imagine what that looked like. I cannot imagine the fear that people had that when you read the study within 17 minutes just overtaking. That the firefighters losing their own truck because it must have turned so quickly. So walking away... I think the responsibility is policymakers honor those who lost their lives there. Understand the heritage of the location in which it took place. Respect it, but rebuild it. And rebuild it in a manner that this, this can't come back. And I want to spend just the time to say thank you to all the first responders. Thank you to the citizens that came to the call, that brought their own boats to save people. Um, thank you to those who are volunteering that are coming from other states, sacrificing to be a part here to help people simply because they're Americans and they have the serving heart. And thank you to my colleagues um, that we able we work together and show the country that this Congress will do the right thing in the right time. And in this devastation that we can actually honor those who lost their lives but show what true meaning means to help and serve others to rebuild their life again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Speaker, have you been to Lahaina before? Yes, many times. Vacation? Yes.